Hello everyone, and thanks for coming to this presentation for AST51. I'm Supriti Karki, and today I'll talk about how stellar flares and sunspots affect M-dwarfs. M-dwarfs are the most common type of star in our galaxy, and they are very active. This activity, which includes a lot of flares and visible spots on the surfaces, helps us learn about the star's magnetic fields and how stars can affect planets around them. Today, we're going to look at the data in our findings to better understand how these flares and spots are connected. We want to figure out what's happening and why it matters for our knowledge of stars and possibly for planets that might orbit these stars. Before we dive into the details about M-dwarfs, let's take a quick look back at how scientists first started understanding our stars like the sun. Today, our story includes two pioneering scientists, Henry Alexander Deslandres and George Ellery Hale. Both were instrumental in advancing our understanding of the sun through their separate but complementary discoveries. Henry Alexandris, working in France, developed the spectroheliograph around the same time as Hale. This instrument allowed astronomers to take detailed images of the sun in narrow bands of light, helping them study the sun's atmosphere and its features like sunspots. In 1908, Hale discovered something really interesting about these sunspots, that they weren't just random dark spots. They were actually areas of really strong magnetic fields, and this was the first time anyone had ever connected the magnetic fields with features on the suns. Hale's discoveries didn't just stop with finding out what sunspots were. He also learned about the sun's magnetic cycle, which helped explain why we see more sunspots at times than at others. The idea of a magnetic cycle doesn't just apply to our sun, though. It's something we see in other stars, too, especially the active ones called M-dars that we study today. Back in Hale's time, telescopes weren't as powerful as they were now, but his discoveries were a big deal, and they helped us to start to understand not just our sun, but other stars in the universe. Now, we use even better tools and technology to study stars, but we're still building on what Hale and other early astronomers started. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about how we use what they discovered to learn more about flares and spots on M-dwarfs. M-dwarfs, while smaller and cooler than our sun, exhibit some of the most intense magnetic activities observed in the galaxy. This makes them excellent subjects for studying stellar magnetic behaviors more extensively. Building on this historical foundation, our research aims to dwell deeper into how flares and spots manifest on M-dwarfs. Using the latest data and tools, we explore the dynamic interaction between these phenomena, seeking to understand not just why they're here, but also their implication for the star's environments. Let's begin by defining what we mean by stellar spots and stellar flares. Stellar flares are intense bursts of radiation that come up from the surface of stars, including our own sun. These flares result from the, hit, from the sudden release of magnetic energy stored in the star's atmosphere. This energy heats the star's gas to a million of degrees, causing it to radiate across the electromagnetic spectrum. Similar to sunspots on the sun, stellar spots are relatively cooler and darker patches on the surface of a star caused by magnetic fields that inhibit convection within the star's atmosphere. These spots are significant because they are associated with magnetic activity and can affect the overall brightness of a star as they rotate in and out of view. Understanding these phenomena is so important because they tell us about the magnetic dynamics within stars. In M-dwarfs, spheres and spots can be extremely pronounced and influence a star's luminosity significantly. Moreover, the frequency and intensity of flares can disrupt planetary atmospheres or even strip them away entirely. Our objective has been clear from the start, to analyze the relationship between stellar flares and spots on a sample of M-dwarfs. Our primary data sources included the latest findings from the Petrucci study, as well as comprehensive data sets of M-dwarfs from tables 1 and 2 from the satellite test, which provided detailed observations of flare frequency, spot characteristics, and their impacts on stellar luminosity. To put it into perspective, our data set from Table 1 has 208 unique M-dwarfs, and Table 2 has 103. That's a lot of stars, and there's just no possible way of being able to look and analyze all of these stars. So, it is important to note that the stars from Table 1 were filtered so that the period-to-error ratio on all the stars had to have been above oh, 1,500, and that the false alarm probability was less than 5%. 
The period to error ratio is a measure of how precisely the period of a repeating event is determined. A high ratio indicates that the period is determined very precisely relative to the uncertainty in its measurement. A threshold of 1500 ensures that the period is well constrained and not just as a result of observational scatter or noise. A high period to error ratio often correlates with statistical significance, implying that the likelihood of the period being a spurious detection due to random fluctuations is very low. This is really important for studies where accurate periodicity informs critical conclusions. Similarly, the FDIC gauges the likelihood that a detected signal is false, essentially that it is caused by noise rather than any genuine astronomical or physical phenomenon. Setting a threshold of less than 5% is common in statistical hypotheses testing and means that there is a 95% confidence interval that the detected signal is real. Since data in astrophysics can often be noisy and conditions less than ideal, applying a stringent FTIC threshold ensures that the most convincing signals are considered, enhancing the overall quality and reliability of the analysis. Doing this left us with nine stars, and by counting the number of occurrences each star had once the table one data merged with table two, we found the following stars with the most number of flares. For this project, we will be taking a look at the stars with the tick ID 2204-2907, 307-95-6653, and 389-051-009, and taking a look at their original and detrended light curves, flattened flux with flares and light curve trends, phase folded light curves with flare indicators, and flare energies versus phases to analyze and understand the relationship between stellar flares and spots on M dwarfs. As we proceed, I will share some of the key insights and data visualizations from our research, highlighting how these, com how these findings contribute to our understanding of stellar dynamics. But, before we go into a detailed examination of flares and spots, let's take a closer look at our data on how flare energy changes over time for specific stars. This graph represents the flare energy for several M dwarfs, but we'll focus on the three particular ones mentioned earlier. This star shows consistency over time, with most flares registering low energy levels that do not vary significantly. This could indicate a stable magnetic environment or a cycle of activity that is less prone to dramatic fluctuations. Then this dwarf shows a more interesting pattern with flare energy decreasing notably over time. The highest flare energy occurs early in the observation period with a rapid decline to a lower stable energy levels thereafter. This trend might suggest a period of intense magnetic activity followed by a stabilization phase. Similarly, this star exhibits low energy flares that remain significantly constant throughout the observed time frame. Such consistency could imply a magnetic field with minor fluctuations or a star that has settled into a steady state of activity. Now, let's take a closer look at the light curve of these stars. This star shows a denser clustering of flare activity with more frequent high energy flares than the other two stars. Again, the normalization accentuates these clusters, indicating potential hotspots of magnetic activity or complex star spot cycles. You can see here that there are low level fluctuations in normalized flux with few significant spikes indicate, indicating flare events here. After removing broader light curve trends and normalizing the data, the flare events become more distinct, confirming their sporadic nature and varying intensity. For this star, you can see more pronounced variability in higher amplitude fluctuations, suggesting a more active stellar surface and post tending we see clear patterns of flare activity which could be tied to the magnetic cycle phases or rotation periods. As we continue, I'll use these observations to build a model of flare and spot dynamics on these stars. Now, let's closely examine the effects of stellar flares on the observed flux values. Here, you can see periodic flare spikes that neatly correlate with the star's rotational period, clearly showing the impact of flares on the normalized flux. This star displays a stable flux line with sporadic significant spikes at flare times, dramatically illustrating how even brief flare events can drastically alter the observed flux. Finally, this star shows more frequent flare activity with visible spikes in flux values, particularly dense at certain times. This indicates not just an active stellar surface, but also how flares actively shape the observed light curve. 
Now, let's take a look at stellar flare spots and rotation periods using phase-folded light curves. Phase folding helps us understand the repetitive nature of stellar phenomena by aligning light curve data according to the stellar rotation period. This method reveals patterns in flare activity and spot visibility against the stellar rotation cycle by aligning individual flares across multiple rotation periods to a common phase scale ranging from 0 to 1, where 1 completes a full rotation cycle. The light curve in this image is relatively flat compared to the others with no obvious periodic variability. The notable feature is the large flare bend around phase 0.7 with a clear pattern of brightness variations. It's difficult to draw conclusions about the relationship between flares and star spots for this particular star. The light curve here shows a clear dip in brightness at around phase 0.5 which could indicate a star spot rotating into view. However, the shape of the light curve is not truly sinusoidal as there are additional smaller dips and variations throughout the phase. The flares seem to be distributed all across phases, not just concentrated near the main dip. This light curve has even more complex variations with multiple dips and peaks across the phase. The flares are scattered throughout the phase, and don't seem to be strongly associated with any particular brightness minimum. The lack of a clear sinusoidal pattern suggests that there may be multiple spots or surface features contributing to the brightness variations. Just as a quick note, I did end up finding some interesting things between flare energies and phases. For each stars, we observe the distributions of flare energies across different phases of the stellar rotation to tell us whether there's a pattern indicating that flares are more energetic at certain phases, possibly correlating with the positions of the stellar spots. The regression line across these plots show a flat trend with an R squared value close to zero for all three tick IDs. This indicates no significant correlation between the flare energies and the phases at which they occur. The p-values being greater than 5% support this lack of correlation, suggesting that within the rotational cycle, flare energies do not systematically vary with the phases. These findings imply that the spots on these M-dwarfs do not show a simple direct influence on the energy of flares based on their rotation phase. Surprisingly, this may suggest that the flares are influenced by more complex magnetic interactions that are not solely determined by visible spots or the straightforward rotational modulation. Based on my findings, it appears that we can draw a few important conclusions about the interplay between stellar flares, spots, and their rotation phases on M-dwarfs. The phase-folded curves reveal that flares do not occur at specific phases more frequently. This suggests a strong link between the stellar rotation and the timing of flare occurrences, likely due to the presence of magnetic spots that become more prominently aligned with our line of sight during these phases. Despite the apparent correlation between flare timing and stellar rotation, the flare energies remain con consistent across different phases. The regression analysis across the data sets for ticks 2204 to 9097 307-956-653 and 389-051009 shows no significant variation in flare energy that correlates with the rotation phases. This implies that the energy released during flares is influenced by broader or more complex magnetic interactions that are not solely dependent on the position of spots. The consistent energy levels of flares across different rotational phases, despite their frequent occurrence at certain phases suggests that while magnetic spots are crucial for the initiation of flares, the actual energy released during these flares may involve additional factors. This could include the star's overall magnetic field configuration or the internal dynamics that are not directly visible through spot activity alone. In conclusion, while our findings underscore a clear relationship between flare occurrences and stellar rotations due to magnetic spots, they also highlight the independence of flare energy from these rotational phases. This challenges us to delve deeper into the magnetic nature of M-dwarfs, pushing forward our challenge and understanding of their dynamic environments. Thank you for your attention, and I'm eager to discuss these findings and their implications further through email. Hope you have a great start to your summer.